que está horrível? Hã? Que? A? A? Tá bom. Bom, boa tarde a todos. É, a gente já vai começar, então, a nosso seminário de hoje. E eu vou trocar para o inglês, porque os nossos é, visitantes hoje são internacionais. Né? Uh, so, I'm switching to English to present our speakers today. And uh, we'll have a double presentation. We are going to start with... Uh, Dr. Uh, Holland, but I'm going to start presenting Dr. Sai Reddy, that will be our second speaker. Dr. Sai is a, an associate professor at uh, ETH Zurich uh, in the Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering. His academic research is focused on emerging field of systems, synthetic and computational Im immunology. Sai is uh, originally a bioengineering. He has a bioengineering background, and he did his PhD and postdoc in immune bioengineering. And being from a bioengineering background, he is uh, also an entrepreneur. So he has founded three companies based on technology developed in his academic lab research. Deep CDR Biologics for Antibody Drug Discovery and Engineering, uh, and Immune Therapeutics for T cell based cancer uh, immunotherapies, uh, and, and CELTA for allogeneic off the shelf immune cell therapy. So um, we can see he, he has a broad interest in the field of uh, bioengineering. Uh, but we will start with Dr. George Hollander. Uh, George is a, a pediatrician uh, and an experimental immunologist, um, and he loves Brazil. He has been in Brazil many times, and he loves words that end in ão, like coração, operação. Um, <laughs> And this has even given him some problems with his daughter. <laughs> uh, but uh, we are very pleased to have you here, George. And George is presently at uh, the Hoffman and Action Medical Research Professor of Developmental Medicine. He is head of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Oxford and the director of Basel Research Center for Child and Health of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Uh, and the 
University of Basel. So, thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, we have very, we had a, a very nice discussion about future collaborations between uh, Oxford and uh, an institute that they are working on, uh, and the city of Asinas. And uh, with that, I pass the word to George. Thank you very much, George, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me without? Yeah. Yeah, but within, within the microphone. Oh, because of, yeah, okay. Right, um, so we thought we split the, a little bit more than an hour seminar, into two parts, and what I'd like to do to talk to you today is about the thymus. And a couple of years ago, if I were to present a seminar on the thymus, I could have basically cited a Nobel Prize winning laureate who said the thymus is an evolutionary accident of no great significance. And at that point, we could stop the seminar, I could take one or two questions, and we would be done. However, um, <coughs> sorry, he was born in Brazil, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, um, Medewa was luckily not correct, and as you know, the thymus is really absolutely essential for um, our adaptive immune response, and um, this is where the T-cell compartment um, basically learns to distinguish between self and non-self. This is all familiar to you, and so it doesn't come as a surprise that when we look at T-cell development, that uh, this occurs in the thymus typically um, and exclusively, actually, from bone marrow-derived precursor cells. Now, the thymus has been, for a very long period of time, some kind of a black box, where we know that the cells get in and eventually get out as mature T-cells, but what homes to the thymus was for some time not specifically uh, defined. And um, a lot of phenotypic research and some functional research has over the last uh, years clearly shown that the precursors enter um, the thymus at this corticomedullary junction and then travel through the depth of the cortex to access the medulla and then eventually exit. And this process basically goes hand in hand with the maturation of T cells, so where at the end you have both CD4 and CD8 effector T cells, you have regulatory T cells, you have NK T cells, and gamma delta T cells. It took a while to fully understand that this is not a cell autonomous process, but this process requires a number of additional cell types, the thymic stroma cells, that control the entrance of the bone marrow-derived precursors and their subsequent differentiation and selection. So during that development in the thymus, um, as you know, there is a close physical and functional interaction between the developing thymocytes and the thymic epithelial cells. And when you then look at the complexity of the thymic stroma cells, it becomes very quickly clear that we have different compartments of stroma cells that create different niches for the different elements in the development. So for example, and I'll get back to that, at one point, the T cells express a T cell antigen receptor on the surface, and the specificity of that receptor is absolutely random. And in order to avoid autoimmunity or non-functional T cells, these T cell receptors need to be checked qualitatively. And this occurs in very close interaction with different thymic epithelial cells, so-called TEX, either in the cortex or in the medulla, but also uh, antigen-presenting cells of hematopoietic origin or fibroblasts and endothelial cells that also shape the thymic microenvironment. And so staining a section of the thymus for approximately 36 different epitopes starts to show that 
the overall structure of the thymus has an outer cortex, an inner medulla, but there's much, much more to it. And so we were particularly interested in finding out what cell types are present in the thymus, what is their developmental program, and what is their functionality. And using both single cell RNA sequencing and single cell ataxic, you can see now for non-lymphoid cells the complexity of the different cell types that make up the thymic microenvironment. And this complexity is not static. This complexity changes with the development of the individual. And this is data from human um, <coughs> thymy, where at gestation week 10 and 12, we had samples that we could look at. And you can see over time, the different thymic epithelial subtypes, both of cortex and medulla, change their relative frequency during um, the first weeks of gestation after the thymus anlage has been formed at around week seven and in the first weeks after life. But this is not only true for thymic epithelial cells, it also holds true <coughs> for the different non-epithelial, non-hematopoietic stroma cells, as shown here, as well as, for example, a number of different hematopoietic antigen-presenting cells. So all this should just give you the impression that the thymus is composed of many different subpopulations of non-hematopoietic cells or non-lymphoid cells, and that their composition, complexity, maturity changes very dramatically throughout gestation and in part also postnatally. What um, we knew from mouse experiments, and some of them are confirmed also in human primary immune deficiencies, is that the different thymic epithelial cells have different functions. Those epithelial cells that are in the cortex control the entry of bone marrow-derived precursors through the vasculature. They commit them to a T-cell lineage fate. They expand these cells enormously, probably a 10 to the five fold. And then there is this process I already referred to as positive and negative selection, where the thymus basically controls the quality of the clonally chosen T cell antigen receptor on the developing thymocytes. Once the thymocytes have surpassed positive and negative selection in the cortex, they enter the medulla and there's yet another round of negative selection to remove autoreactive T cells. There's a post-maturational um, process that then subsequently takes place and the cells are ready to exit. So from these different functional activities, you would already anticipate that the stromal compartment must be very complex because in order to expand T cells, you might need another set of molecules than the molecules that are in play for the selection and uh, the stimulation, uh, for example, of further maturation. And this is really where people interested in thymic epithelial cell development get excited, even if there are only few of those in the world. <laughs> and um, what we then started to look at is how these thymic epithelial cells work, better understand where they came from and how they differentiate, because there are a number of diseases, though rare, that um, present themselves with too small of a thymus or, no absent, or a complete absence of thymus, uh, typically due to um, deficiencies in thymic epithelial cells. And what you see here uh, on the right is a single thymic epithelial cell. It looks like a sponge, and the white balls are individual thymocytes from a mouse, from the cortex, and you can now start to understand that these cells have a highly complex nature. They don't sit on the basal membrane, although they are thymic epithelial cells or epithelial cells, and they form a scaffold through which the T cells percolate and adapt their different maturational stages. So the thymic epithelial cell morphology is highly complex, 
differs between cortex and medulla, and we wanted to understand how are these cells interacting with thymocytes. And for that, um, Andreas in the lab basically developed a algorithm to identify the outline of thymic epithelial cells. And what you see here is black holes are actually the spaces where thymocytes are in direct contact with thymic epithelial cells because they present antigens or they present molecules for further differentiation. So if we then start to look at these complex thymic epithelial cells in the microenvironment using a number of different markers, you can start to appreciate that um, the complexity of the cortex and the medulla can be further segregated in particular domains. And this is ongoing research in the lab, but we can now, on a single section, histological section, we can distinguish up to 38 different cell types and start to ask questions. What is their neighborhood? With whom do they interact to better understand these niches and their functional role? And so these functional thymic regions can then computationally be defined by the composition of particular cell types that are next to each other in certain um, neighborhoods. And all of a sudden, and way and beyond what you normally can see in a typical um, histology, we can now define that the cortex is actually much, much more complex with microenvironments and niches that relate to particular developmental stages. And the same thing is here in the medulla, um, as shown in these three islands. This allows us then to start to track the path of thymocytes in their maturation through these different regions and allows us finally to basically define areas where particular functional um, roles happen. Now what all, what is basically very important for these different functions of thymic epithelial cells is that thymic epithelial cells express a transcription factor called FOXN1. This transcription factor has a central forkhead domain which binds, as we have shown in vivo, um, a relatively small motif of DNA. And when we crystallized this transcription factor, it became clear that it fits very, very nicely in the larger groove of the DNA helix, and it does so at approximately 100, uh, 1,700 uh, different sites in the thymic epithelial cells. Now, thymic uh, epithelial cells are absolutely required to express the FOXN1 because if you lack FOXN1 due to a spontaneous mutation or gene-targeted mutation, you are actually a nude mouse. And the very same thing also exists in humans where children are born without a thymus because their FOXN1 function is disrupted. So we became interested in how FOXN1 works and how FOXN1 interacts with um, DNA to drive transcription. And what we initially saw was that FOXN1 actually in the nuclei of thymic epithelial cells seem to form these um, aggregates and um, provides you with this kind of spotted um, appearance of their presence in nuclei. And this was somewhat interesting because um, there is a group of different transcription factors that display this kind of a pattern. And so we wanted to know whether the pattern of this speckled appearance or these condensates, whether this is related to a particular part of the FOXN1 molecule. Now I have to add here that um, we had been presented with a patient that was born without a thymus. And this patient had a autosomal dominant mutation of FOXN1, which is shown here, whereby a normal sequence of FOXN1 
was stopped through uh, a premature stop codon, um, or a shift first, sorry, a first shift in uh, the sequence of the C-terminal end of the molecule, uh, a scrambled sequence, and then a premature stop. So we used this human spontaneous mutation that is disease relevant and compared it to other mutations and wondered whether normal FOXN1 behavior can be recapitulated um, in the absence of the full length structure of FOXN1. And we did that using uh, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, which is basically a method where you look into the nucleus of a, of a, of a cell, in our case thymic epithelial cell, we have labeled the different mutations of FOXN1 with a fluorochrome, in this case GFP, and then you can shine a very bright light onto these molecules. The fluorescent uh, part of the molecule is being bleached, can't be recovered um, typically, and you can then see what happens with the molecule that has been um, basically uh, photobleached. And when we do that, what you can see is here such a condensate in the nucleus of a thymic epithelial cell up here. We bleach it with bright light and within a short period of time, this condensate is green again. Which means basically that within a couple of seconds, the photo bleaching is effective, but the condensate is again gaining uh, fluorescence because new molecules, which were not photobleached, come into that particular aggregate of FOXN1 molecules in the nucleus. And now comparing the different mutations, what we saw is that wild-type FOXN1 molecules, after photobleaching, are able to move back into these condensates and continue to have functional FOXN1 molecules present for transcription, while the patient had a FOXN1 that was unable to do so. So the motility of the transcription factor under these experimental conditions was clearly um, disrupted. Now from other studies that we and others have done looking into the behavior of transcription factors, we suspected that FOXN1 has cofactors. And so we did immunoprecipitation of FOXN1, identified a couple of proteins, sequenced them, and found out that FOXN1 actually interacts with approximately 23 other factors. Some of them uh, we further characterized, and one is a molecule called CBP, which interacts with FOXN1, stains the same condensates in the nucleus as what we've seen, and if we generate an experimental system in which we can introduce full-length FOXN1 but can knock down or knock out with CRISPR individual cofactors, what we see is that CBP, as shown here in the gray bar, is absolutely required for FOXN1 to act as a transcription factor. Here on the y-axis you have the percentage of extent of inhibition, so if you knock out FOXN1, then the system obviously doesn't work at all, but if you knock out CBP, there's a 70% loss of FOXN1 activity. And going back quickly to that patient that I've described, this patient can't capture CBP, and um, therefore a cofactor is missing in the interaction, in the molecular interaction with FOXN1, and its transcriptional function. Now having shown that FOXN1 is important and its presence is required to avoid um, a loss of thymic epithelial cell development and thus T cell function, we looked in elderly mice whether FOXN1 uh, expression would be changed. And what you see here is a cut through the thymus of a mouse and we stained the thymic epithelial cells for the presence of FOXN1, which is exclusively only in thymic epithelial cells, and for a thymic epithelial cell marker, P63, that is in red. And wherever you see yellow, then both FOXN1 
is present in a nucleus that belongs to a thymic epithelial cells. But when you look a little bit closer, you see also some thymic epithelial cells in which FOXN1 is missing. And this is a normal adult mouse. And so we wondered, how is it possible that the thymic epithelial cell requires FOXN1 early in life, but later it seems to be some kind of a luxury for some cells uh, to express FOXN1, and would these cells still be functional? And so <coughs> we wanted to look into that phenomenon a little bit closer, used other um, types of immunohistochemistry, as shown down here, where the cell body is in green, staining cytokeratins, and the nuclei are in red, and in white is the co-expression of FOXIN1, providing you with a pink color. So again, we find not all thymic epithelial cells to be uh, positive for FOXIN1. This is a little bit of a tedious um, analysis because we need to um, permeate cells uh, to stain for FOXIN1, and therefore we created transgenic mice that express FOXN1 on one allele normally, and on the other allele, it's a knock-in for GFP. So all the cells that are green would be thymic epithelial cells if they were to express both loci. And if we do this analysis, then we now see that in the course of the life of a mouse at embryonic age 14.5 to week 16, did you see that initially all thymic epithelial cells, and this is just gated for thymic epithelial cells, express FOXN1, but with progressive age, you have more and more cells that don't express FOXN1. This is fairly surprising, as I said, because FOXN1 is so important for normal development and function. And <coughs> lo and behold, we actually see that all cells express FOXN1, or almost all cells express FOXN1, late in gestation and early after birth, but up to 70% of cortical epithelial cells lose FOXN1 as they go on. So does that in any way relate to a change in function? We did uh, massively parallel flow cytometry to, by flow cytometry, identify the different thymic epithelial cell subpopulation populations as shown here by these different um, colors, uh, identified different uh, thymic epithelial cell subpopulations, and then checked in these populations whether they express FOXN1. And as you can see, in, a six, in an eight-week-old uh, mouse, it's only the mature medullary epithelial cells shown here, and the subpopulation of perinatal because we see these cells particularly prominent uh, after birth, perinatal thymic epithelial cells that continue to express detectable protein levels of FOXN1. And these protein levels of FOXN1 change with age, as you can see, in some that are positive, and the least affected one are these perinatal CTECs and the most affected one are the mature cortical epithelial cells, as shown here. So we have a very dynamic change in the loss of FOXN1, depending what phenotype you are, where you are positioned in the thymus, and what role it might be, and therefore the impact of a loss of FOXN1 was of interest to us. We saw the very same data, basically, in a single-cell RNA-seq analysis, where the green dots represent thymic epithelial cells that still express um, FOXN1 and the gray ones that don't express FOXN1 in these knock-in mice. So how do they differentiate? Or how, do, how different are these thymic epithelial cells that maintain FOXN1 expression? And is it just something that we have found that has no functional consequence, or is there really something that would relate also to the loss of function of an elderly thymus, which is known as thymic involution um, in part. And so we looked first at the chromatin accessibility of thymic epithelial cells with an interest of 
can we make, can we see a distinction between those thymic epithelial cells here in green that still maintain FOXIN1 expression and those that have lost FOXIN1 expression. And what you can see here in these three populations, which really matter in this case, now in the perinatal CTEX, in the mature CTEX, and in a population that is basically between cortical and medullary epithelial cells, that as soon as you lose FOXIN1 expression, you also have less of an open chromatin containing the motifs for FOXIN1 binding. FOXIN1 promoter accessibility is also different between these two populations and the FOXIN1 high confidence target. So the genes that we know that are targeted and controlled in their expression by FOXIN1 also show a difference. So if you don't have FOXIN1, it correlates with the motifs being less accessible, the promoter not being bound by FOXIN1, and the target molecules being decreased. There is an epigenetic uh, pattern to this that we have identified, whereby um, the analysis uh, using single cell ataxic provides us with a number of peaks um, <coughs> that, that are identical between different cortical thymic epithelial cell populations. We find, however, other peaks that are different, that are typical between the perinatal CTEX and TEX that can go either into a cortex or into a medullary phenotype, but that seem to be largely missing between um, medullary and cortical thymic epithelial cells. And if we now look in the intertypical um, thymic epithelial cells that either still or have lost the expression of FOXIN1, you can see now also changes in the epigenome between these two populations indicating that part of the regulation could indeed be the loss of accessibility for transcription factors driving FOXIN1. Now, <coughs> as shown initially, thymic epithelial cells provide antigen and other important factors for T-cell differentiation. So does it really matter whether you express FOXIN1 or not in thymic epithelial cells? And to address this, and this is the last set of experiments, um, we basically looked again at the development of thymocytes and isolated immature thymocytes at the stage where they don't express the T-cell antigen receptor yet and co-cultured them with either FOXN1 expressing or FOXN1 non-expressing thymic epithelial cells. And what you can see is that if thymocytes that are developing are left on their own, they don't really expand. If they are together with thymic epithelial cells that have lost the expression of FOXN1, they expand a little bit, but it is only those thymic epithelial cells that express FOXN1 that appear to provide the right in my in microenvironment and the right molecular clues um, and cues for these cells to expand numerically and to be positively selected, as shown here by the acquisition of a CD4 and CD8 cell surface molecule, which represents basically the transition from immature to less immature thymocytes. So FOXIN1 continues to play a role, and if you have in these eight-week-old mice FOXIN1 positive cells, then these thymic epithelial cells are best placed to um, help thymocytes mature. The very same thing holds true for um, the further maturation and selection of thymocytes. Thymic epithelial cells that continue to express FOXIN1 do this job much, much better. So they are really the workhorses of normal T cell development and allow the positive selection of thymocytes, namely the selection of those thymocytes that express a useful and meaningful T cell antigen receptor. Now, what controls the loss of FOXIN1? We don't know it yet at the molecular level, but at the cellular level, we have a good idea what uh, drives this loss of FOXIN1. If you take a normal thymus, as shown here, with the round cells in beige being the thymocytes, 
and the blue cells being the thymic epithelial cells, we can now manipulate this environment by going into mice that have a deficiency in forming mature T cells and B cells, so-called RAG deficient mice. Now in the RAG deficient mice, the density or the total amount of uh, thymocytes is massively reduced, while the number of thymic epithelial cells is largely unaffected. And if we look in these mice now, we can see that RAG deficient mice have practically no mature thymocytes, as shown here by CD4 and CD8 stain. Their number of FOXIN1 thymic epithelial cells is extremely high, although these mice are six weeks old. And when we then stimulate these mice with an antibody against the CD3 complex, so that these mice now start to produce dose-dependent more or massively more double positive cells, if we then look in these mice for the presence of FOXN1 positive thymic epithelial cells, you can see that the frequency of these cells is decreasing progressively, telling us that the number of FOXN1 negative thymic epithelial cells correlates with the overall number of double positive thymocytes. In order to prove that for sure, we've done the other experiment where we take a normal thymus and we treated the thymus with high doses of corticosteroids, which kills thymocytes. And now all of a sudden, from low frequencies of FOXN1 positive thymic epithelial cells, we end up with high frequencies of thymic epithelial cells. And so finally, does that matter in a normal physiological condition? And what are the cells that associate with FOXN1 negative or FOXN1 positive thymic epithelial cells in C2 in a normal mouse? And for that, <coughs> we went back to a multi-parameter uh, histo uh, histology of the thymus section here of a mouse, where we only looked at the cortical regions, shown here in color, and the immature thymocytes, the pre-selection double positive and the post-selection double positive thymocytes accumulate close to the corticomedullary junction, here shown in yellow, or in the depth of the cortex, but not in the subcapsular region. And if we now look in these regions, do we find a proportionate distribution of FOXN1 positive and FOXN1 negative thymocytes? You can see that over the full length of the cortex, we basically have a similar representation of FOXN1 positive and FOXN1 negative thymocytes. We then went back and looked at which cell types are associated with FOXN1 negative or positive thymocytes within three and six microns of the surface of the thymic epithelial cells. And what we see is that pre-selection thymocytes are in close proximity with FOXN1 positive thymic epithelial cells, shown here as a positive value, and are not accumulating or more frequent in the presence of FOXN1 negative thymocytes, which would give us a negative value. However, once thymocytes have progressed post-selection, you'll find them more frequently associated with FOXN1 negative thymocytes, indicating that they don't need the support after selection of FOXN1 expression in thymic epithelial cells. Um, this is an experiment I already mentioned, so where we use dexamethasone to remove double positive cells, and basically with that we have um, FOXN1 reoccurring. So jet lag has clearly played here a game in the sequence of the data I wanted to present to you. I was pretty sure I was going to show them, but last but not least, um, you got the gist. It is a crosstalk between thymocytes and thymic epithelial cells that play a role. And with the 
loss of foxin with the loss of thymocytes and the increase of foxin one um, expression, what you see is that the number of different target molecules um, come into play, are higher expressed in thymic epithelial cells, and um, they represent a number of different pathways which are relevant to what we are interested in, naming epidermal cell differentiation or epithelial cell differentiation, regulation of these cells and their proliferation, and activation of cytokine-mediated pathways. And we know at the moment that several um, cytokines play a role for this expansion. So in short, what I try to um, show you is the thymic architecture is very complex. Um, it allows for the creation of individual microenvironments. Initially, FOXN1 is very important, but although it is being lost in its expression in the entirety uh, or in a fraction of thymic epithelial cells, the entirety of thymic epithelial cells still allows the um, differentiation and selection of some T cells, whereby, however, FOXN1 continues to play a major role um, in the um, selection uh, of T cells, and it is double positive thymocytes, at least, that negatively control FOXN1 expression in thymic epithelial cells. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the people in my Oxford lab, the people in my Basel lab, and collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention. If we have one or two questions before the next presentation, very quick questions. Ricardo. Uh, very nice, and uh, I don't understand anything about time of Nor science. Do I. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, does the um, does this molecule affect MHC expression or other um, other molecules involved in presentation, ancient presentation, or the presentation of self ancients? By so, yeah. cells. so um, FOXN1 is absolutely required to um, produce a number of molecules which are related to the function of thymic epithelial cells as antigen-presenting cells. So, for example, it is absolutely critical for the expression of a number of proteases that chop the self-antigens into peptides to be presented. It is important... Uh, to drive the expression of CD83, which co-associates with class 1. And it is also important for a number of cytokines and chemokines. So it is really very central. Yeah, and then does other cells outside of the thymus uh, express FOXN? FOXN1, yeah. yes. Um, it's skin cells, and that's why... It's called the nude phenotype, because if you don't have FOXN1, uh, homologous loss of FOXN1, um, what you have is no hair. However, no hair in this case means that you still have the hair follicles. But as soon as the hair comes out and is at the surface of the skin, it breaks off because the hair shaft is not normally uh, keratinocyte. Uh, ke keratinized. So what happens is these mice appear to be hairless, but in older mice you can see in the back of the neck a tuft of hair, and that is the place where they can't have physically rubbing and breaking off the hair. So basically we shouldn't call them nude mice, we should call them shaved mice. So. So if I understand you correctly, you show that uh, with aging, you have an alteration of FOXN1. Can you extrapolate uh, that to the kind of evolution biological need of antigen recognition and how as you are a newborn baby and when you're an older person, that is very different? That's eventually where we would like to go. Okay. We would like to know what is the repertoire in a young versus an old individual. 
and what is the repertoire specifically that has been selected on Foxin1 positive versus Foxin1 negative thymic epithelial cells. This is still a way to go. What we know, however, is that if you rejuvenate the thymus, and they are chemical and more biological approaches, you end up with an increase of Foxin1 again. Yeah, I, I, I also would like to, to follow this question. Do you have any hypothesis why you, as you age, you lose Foxin1? And does it have anything related to the thymus involution? So it, it co-occurs with thymus involution. Um, we know that if you lose FOXN1, as shown here, you still can be a thymic epithelial cell. What we have not tested yet is whether these cells proliferate or are maintained uh, at the same frequency. What we see, however, is that with age, you get fewer and fewer FOXN1 positive thymic epithelial cells. So there must be a growth or differentiation disadvantage. How this relates to the involution um, is a great, great question and allows you to speculate and nobody can prove whether you're right or wrong. Okay. Because <laughs> the problem with thymus involution is it starts in the second year of life relative to your body size. And so one of the major um, hypotheses was generating thymocytes of which 95% are deleted in the thymus because they are either useless or dangerous is an enormous energetic waste. And probably nature has adopted a way to save that energy by just um, creating thymus involution. But this is a hand-waving um, argument because there are certain animals that don't involute the thymus and maintain, you know, an active T cell repertoire. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, pass the word to Sai. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so now that George has talked a lot about T cells, you'll see me talk uh, a bit more today about B cells and antibodies. Before I talk about SARS-CoV-2, I'm going to bring up a topic that's uh, because we had some discussions um, earlier today. I'm also going to talk about antibody engineering in a minute. All right, so as uh, mentioned before, my research is uh, at the interface of, it's basically immune engineering, which means it's at the interface of systems immunology, which is just using high throughput tools, uh, including sequencing. Uh, synthetic immunology, which is engineering components like molecules and cells, and then computational immunology, which is using all of the various techniques in bioinformatics as, as well as machine learning. Um, I'm not going to really talk about anything with systems uh, and computational immunology in great depth today, but I wanted to just highlight that we've done a lot of years of research on immune repertoire profiling. Um, so we did some work on doing things like large-scale network analysis of antibody repertoires. We looked at the impact of different things like uh, immunization and the genetic background, and these are in mouse studies on uh, basically B cell repertoires across different stages of development uh, or differentiation. And we've even done some technical things around making sequencing of antibody repertoires more accurate. Um, but one story that um, I can only show for half a slide, but it's one of my favorite uh, studies that we've done, is that we, we characterized in detail clonally expanded plasma cells from immunized mice. And what you're seeing here is single cell sequencing of plasma cells of five immunized mice. And for a subset of these mice, we basically expressed hundreds of antibodies and measured their binding or non-binding based on their ex uh, level of clonal expansion. And some of the interesting outcomes of this study is that antigen specificity is basically stochastic uh, beyond the top 10 clones. Then it's, it's not really correlated to being the most expanded clone anymore being antigen specific. Uh, affinity does not appear to correlate with higher levels of clonal expansion or somatic hypermutation. That was a kind of a counterintuitive result. And there seems to be convergence towards dominant epitopes despite different sequence diversity. So it's a really uh, kind of a, our closest effort to try to solve, answer some basic questions in B cell uh, and antibody uh, biology um, using this kind of systems approach. 
Uh, and then we had a lot of other studies where we have with collaborators and, and also from the group. Okay, but most of what I want to talk about today is um, this idea of what, what I like to call next generation protein engineering. So the field of protein engineering has been established now for probably about three decades, um, or at least modern protein engineering. And it starts with this idea of directed evolution, where you make mutations to proteins, you select them, and you can improve their properties. Uh, this is, of course, a Nobel Prize winning technology from 2000, Nobel Prize in 2019 to Francis Arnold, uh, George Smith, and Greg Winter. Um, and then mutagenesis libraries is another tool that's used, display platforms like phage and yeast display, and also structure guided design. All of these have been around for a while. They're really effective for drug discovery, development, and protein sciences. But what I want to hopefully show you today is that there is merging tools. I think everybody appreciates genome editing, like CRISPR-Cas9 has revolutionized biotechnology in many ways. But I don't think many people think about CRISPR-Cas9 or genome editing in the context of protein engineering. Uh, deep sequencing, of course, genomics, deep sequencing, very big uh, for genetics and biology. But it also has a lot of potential for protein engineering. And the last thing, obviously, machine learning is changing all of our lives in many different ways. But I think it also has a chance to make some impact here. And so this idea of next generation protein engineering is using all these techniques, but also these old ones, so not just discarding these, because these are really powerful, combining them and addressing some longstanding uh, questions and problems and opening up new directions for the field. So I want to start with the, uh, the fact that most people probably think antibody therapeutics, pharma, they've got it figured out, because this is the sales in billions of dollars of the top 20, or is it top 10? Uh, top 20, I think, of uh, pharma drugs. Many of these are antibodies. Humira, the blockbuster, uh, the biggest. So this is a pre-pandemic chart, because if I show the 2023 values, they're all impacted by COVID drugs. But anyways, Humira, which is a TNF inhibitor antibody, also known as adalumumab, has 20 billion in sales per year, OK? Um, which is a remarkable number. And, and you might think, okay, it must be such a great drug, right? It must be fantastic. It's got so much sales. When you actually look at it, here's a study, which is only, uh, it's about, I guess, 12 years old now, or uh, 13 years old. Um, they assessed anti-drug antibodies against adalumumab, so patients receiving Humira. Um, and essentially what happens is 45%, so it's a 272 patient cohort, about 120 of those patients had to have be discontinued from tre being treated with that drug. So it's a $20 billion drug, but yet it's not necessarily perfect. In fact, that's why another TNF inhibitor here called Enbrel has $6 billion. And if you went farther down the list, another TNF inhibitor antibody called Remicade has, I think, $4 billion in sales. So pharma has not actually, you know, these are good Humira is 20 years old, or was proved in 2002, which means it was developed using technologies from the 1990s. Um, and so is it really true that these are the best antibody therapies we can make? Is it really true that we should just always be treating them with these uh, technologies? Like imagine you were using any technology from the 1990s today. You, I mean, imagine if it was a phone or if it was a car, right? You would just be, find it ridiculous. So uh, we, part of my thesis is this may be what we should also be thinking about with antibody therapeutics, is we should be developing these using the most modern tools because might actually make better therapeutics. Um, and here's another example. Pfizer dropped this um, uh, therapeutic in phase three, all the way in phase three, while another company uh, actually took it to the clinic, Regeneron got theirs clinically approved. So even if you got the same, if the same target, you're still having pharma companies unable to solve certain properties about these therapeutic therapies, which aren't target related, because if Regeneron has a therapeutic against the same target, it's not about the biology alone, it's cl clearly about the molecule as well. So when it comes to antibody drug candidates, they require a lot of optimization. Most people might just think, oh, does it bind your target? Well, it's a lot more than binding when you want to turn it into an actual drug. It's uh, aspects of PKPD, effector functions, developability, which are biophysical properties. Um, and then there was a, it was a pretty nice study um, from Dane Wittrup and his colleagues 
from uh, about five, six years ago now, where they actually assessed all of the clinical stage antibodies, and they found that antibodies that actually got approved, they came up with a metric uh, for developability, and they put flags, they called them flags, for things that had pr uh, you know, uh, problems with their developability profile. This is unrelated to the binding or the target. It's just the molecule and its properties. And what you see here is that there are several antibody drugs that have been, most antibody drugs that have been approved have zero flags. And most of the ones that actually have uh, a lot of flags don't actually make it all the way through the clinic is, is also included in this analysis. So what this means is that, that there's m a lot that can be optimized to make better therapeutics. Now, when it comes to engineering an antibody or any protein therapeutic, you have to consider that protein sequence space is really huge. And that, what that means is simply that there are 20 amino acids. And so anytime you take a position and you mutate it, you have 20 possible mutations you make, can make. And this ex uh, is a very large number because it goes exp exponentially. So if you have, uh, for example, consider a protein that's only 20 amino acids long, or let's say a segment of a protein. Well, there I that's, that means it's 20 to the 20th power. That's 1 times 10 to the 26th. So if you're trying to optimize something and you have all of these possibilities, you can't actually explore that space. And what I mean by optimization, you may be trying to optimize, you know, not just its affinity, you want to do all these other parameters, its stability, its, develop its uh, solubility, its thermal, uh, thermal, uh, thermal stability as well, um, and immunogenicity eventually. Now, all the experimental tools that people use in protein engineering, like yeast display and phage display, they have a physical limit for the number of variants that they can screen. So these are tools where you, you know, express protein variants on these cells or, you know, phage viruses, and you screen them. Well, they max out around 10 to the 9 for yeast display and 10 to the 11 for phage. And for that simple 20 amino acid stretch, you cover almost none of the, se or such a minuscule part of the sequence space. So what protein engineers really do is they just kind of randomly make these mutations and hope this super small part of the sequence space that they interrogate is giving them a solution to their uh, problems. And if you think about this as a fitness landscape, it means we're always just selecting proteins that have a, a local maximum, but not the globally optimal sequence or uh, molecule. And what I want to show you is that machine learning actually allows you to screen much more of this functional sequence space. Um, and I just want to point out, just give some uh, respect to Richard Fox in this theoretical paper from 20 years ago where he laid out the idea of machine learning and how it can be used in protein engineering. And it's really about uh, essentially being able to use machine learning to understand nonlinear interactions of proteins. Proteins are complex molecules and you cannot use simple linear uh, approaches to address their, um, to predict the behavior of mutations. Uh, and Francis Arnold, who uh, aforementioned won the Nobel Prize in 2019 on directed evolution, put out this review paper which described, you know, essentially machine learning guided directed evolution. Uh, it's really about sampling protein sequence space more completely. So um, what we decided to do is essentially perform protein engineering uh, on a therapeutic antibody to see if we can improve its properties, just like Humira, right? But we didn't cho choose Humira in this case. Uh, what I want to mention is we developed a lot of methods over the years to perform directed evolution using mammalian cells. So why we would do that is that, as I mentioned, um, yeast and phage are often used to do directed evolution. But you can't express a full-length IgG typically with those systems where almost all antibody therapeutics are full-length IgGs. They're glycosylated and they have this, you know, more complex format. So we, you know, developed a lot of tools using genome editing so that we can screen antibodies as IgGs in mammalian cells so they're kind of in their final, uh, very close to the kind of final format they would be as therapeutics. Um, and in this study, what we did is we essentially established a workflow where we took a therapeutic antibody and we did directed evolution techniques, so all experimental, uh, using mammalian display, uh, and then we combined it with machine learning, and I'll walk you through this in a minute. So the first thing is we started with the antibody trastuzumab, it's also known as Herceptin, it's one of the blockbuster, blockbuster drugs from Roche, uh, targeting HER2. So HER2, uh, of course, is, uh, is the uh, is the 
growth factor associated, uh, also associated with many breast cancers, so it's usually used for breast cancer therapy. And trastuzumab, uh, here is the antibody in red here. And I'm highlighting this loop here. This is the CDRH3 of trastuzumab, which uh, has the primary interaction with HER2. And so what we did is we took uh, a mammalian cell expressing trastuzumab. We focus in on the CDRH3, uh, and we used CRISPR-Cas9 to make mutations in the genome of the cell line expressing HER2, uh, her, her or trastuzumab. Um, and we made a, the diversity uh, in a, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly, but basically we used a technique called deep mutational scanning, which means we made single point mutations across this 10 amino acid CDRH3. So the full diversity of the CDRH3 would be 20 to the 10 power, because this is 10 amino acids long. So that's one time sign of 13 that we couldn't, you can't screen that physically, remember? Deep mutational scanning is linear, because you're only making one mutation at a time across these 10 positions. So that diversity is 200. That one we can easily screen. But we use that information, so deep mutational scanning means you make mutations in each of those positions and you screen which mutations still allow you to bind to HER2. And then you end up uh, with kind of a heat map like this. And the main thing, it's better to look at this like as a, as a logo. What this basically shows you is position 105 as an example, this tyrosine or Y cannot be mutated. If you mutate the Y, you cannot find you cannot recover binding to uh, HER2. But these other positions actually allow a lot of different mutations to take place and still create a binder, potentially a binder to HER2. Now remember though, this full protein sequence space is 10 to the 13. But we can use this information to design a smart library that's based on this diversity. So I call this DMS guided combinatorial library. So now we're making mutations combinatorial, so not just one position across the full CDRH3, but we fix you know, the, the tyrosine because we don't wanna mess around with it because we know that will knock out binding. But we end up allowing for mutations in all these other positions. Now this uh, combinatorial library is still seven times 10 to the eighth. We've removed a lot of the diversity of the full 10 to the 13, but we still end up with quite a diverse profile of potential variants. Uh, then we went and we experimentally screened this, and I just want to note to you, um, due to some technical errors, we only screened a very small library of 40,000 uh, for binding and non-binding to HER2. Uh, is, at first we were kind of worried about this, but ended up kind of moving forward and it worked out anyways, but I'll show you how that means. So that means we sort for a library of this based on this sequence space, but it's only 40,000, and we sort for antibodies, or an, or sorry, antibodies that bind to HER2, um, and then we perform deep sequencing on those binders and non-binders. And then I'm gonna show you what we do with machine learning, but just to quickly um, explain, once we have this sequencing data, we have to turn these amino acids sequence into a way that you can train a machine learning model. And there's a few different ways to do it, but the you know, most simple approach is to use a technique called one-hot encoding. And all that means is here's the CDR3 sequence, right? It's a, the protein sequence. Um, and you put basically a matrix where you have all 20 amino acids here listed across this top row. And then each uh, row here, uh, you get a zero except for the one amino acid that it corresponds to, okay? So it's a very sparse matrix, but now once you have a matrix, a matrix is a number. Uh, in a, a nu it's a matrix, then you can compute with it like using just linear al algebra, matrix, uh, you know, multiplication uh, and such. And that means you can put that number into a neural network and you can train the neural network to essentially learn what is a binder and what is a non-binder to HER2 based on this approach. And I'll, I'll show you exactly um, how to do this. So um, here it is. So we've created this library, we have this data. And so what I wanna show you here is the 40,000 sequences we screen, uh, about 40,000, 38,000. Uh, 11,000 of them were binders and 27,000 were non-binders, okay? So we have that information experimentally. We take 70% of that training data, as we call it, and we train a neural network. And what the neural network is trying to understand is the patterns that the binders have and the non-binders have, so that it can then essentially make a prediction. So we take 30% of the data, which did not go into the training the neural network, but this 30% that's called the test data, we know the answer, because we did the experiment. We know if it's a binder or a non-binder. 
But what we're going to ask is if the neural network can predict, based on that training data, can it take an amino acid sequence and say this is a binding antibody or a non-binder? And what it's going to put out is basically a probability score. So um, making a long story short, you, there's a lot of details in here, this publication, but we ended up using a convolutional neural network, but a lot of different architectures work, so it's not so anything special. Um, and the really uh, great thing is that this is an area under the curve, and essentially what we're showing here, it's a true positive, false positive rate. We have an area under the curve around 0 0.90. Um, now that doesn't mean it's 90% accurate. If I uh, was around anybody who studies machine learning, they would yell at me if I said that. But you can use it as a heuristic to say it's a very accurate model, but I'll show you how that is uh, experimentally in a few minutes. But I want to also show something that's really blew my mind when you really look at this information more carefully. So remember that I said that the full diversity of this library is, w of the CDRH3 is 1 times 10 to the 13. The DMS guided combo library is 7 times 10 to the 8. Okay? Now then what we did is we took 70 mil, so we took 10% of this. We took 7 times 10 to the 7. The reason why we didn't take all times 10 to the 8 is we were doing this on a grad student's computer and we weren't paying for computing power back then. And we didn't need to necessarily go all that high. <coughs> and what we're now going to ask is we're going to take all of these 70 million sequences that we haven't experimentally uh, you know, tested, and we're going to ask the neural network to, for all 70 million, give us a probability score, binding or non-binding. Um, and so what happens is it predicts from here that 10 million of those sequences are greater than probability 0.5 to bind. 0.5 is kind of right on the edge, so you can increase this threshold and do something a little bit more um, conservative and say anything greater than probability 0.7. This is a little bit subjective, but you know we'd set it at this. That tells you the neural network is predicting that there are six million different CDRH3 sequences that you could replace in trastuzumab and still bind to your target. Um, now that's basically saying 9.1%, right? So 64 million divided by, you know, uh, 10 times, or sorry, 64, uh, 6.4 million, but that's only 10%. If you use the full sequence space, you just multiply it by 10. And so you have 64 million potentially different sequences. That sounds hard to believe, but you, I'm going to show you that you don't even need to worry about the machine learning. The experiment tells you this is true. Because when we did this 4 times 10 to the 4 experimental library and we screened it, do you see here that 9.6% of the uh, binders here, or 9.6% 6, 9 of the library is a binder, okay? Well, 9.6%, if you do the math, the experiment is telling you it's 67 million, okay? Now, this is cyclical because <laughs> the model is trained on the data, so they should match up. But uh, ultimately, you want to ask yourself, doesn't that sound too much? Like, how can you have 67 million different sequences that you can replace in trastuzumab and still get a binder? It sounds crazy. However, that's actually not a big number. Do the math. S divide 67 million by 1 times 10 to the 13, and that's, that's the percentage, okay? 0. 0.000067%. So it's the enormity of protein sequence space that's really telling, that's really uh, driving this. So it's a really big number, but it's actually a very small number when you consider the possible combinations. And then what's really exciting here is that there, these, are, these are now some CDRH3s that we ended up testing in the lab. But what you see here is, here's an example, number 19. So red means it's mutated. So remember, the Y is always fixed. So of the nine positions we mutated, you can recode eight of them and still get a predicted binder, okay? So these are our predictions. I'll show you the data of in a second. So you can completely recode the sequence. So there's some pretty big implications when it comes to intellectual property with that, if I put on my capitalism hat. Um, so we tested 94 of them in the lab, and we were correct basically 98% of the time. Some of the antibodies were actually higher affinity than trastuzumab. Uh, we tested, we did developability assessment, and basically what happens is there are thousands of predicted candidates that could be a better drug 
potentially than trastuzumab in terms of its profile. Even these are some developability things like um, uh, expression, uh, thermal stability, and immunogenicity. So all this is really kind of guiding you at is the, the main point of this is that we can make better antibody drugs with even better profiles than the currently exist. You can completely overcome IP hurdles probably by recoding the sequence. And so makes you wonder, should we always be injecting people with Humira for the next you know, 30, 40 years, or should we start making better therapeutics? Uh, because why should AbbVie make 20 billion a year on it for a drug that clearly has its deficiencies? All right, now for the last few minutes, I just want to jump into SARS-CoV-2, and I can go through this quickly since you're all experts on the topic. Uh, I think all of you know that the RBD is one of the drivers of uh, binding, it drives uh, interactions with ACE2, and there are, have been therapeutic antibodies developed from Regeneron and Eli Lilly at the early stages of the pandemic that target basically the ACE2 binding part of the RBD and drive neutralization. Uh, at the pre, at the very uh, early stage or pre before vaccination was approved, uh, two pharma companies, ELL and Regeneron, got uh, clinical approval for these drugs in the United States. Um, however, when uh, in the RBD is broken up by typically four different epitopes based on antibodies that target them, class one, two, and three. Class one and two really directly interact with ACE2. Uh, Class three, a little less so, but still has potent neutralization. Class four, normally not. And as new, as variants were starting to um, uh, emerge, uh, it was pretty clear that these escape, these were mutations that would drive escape to some of these antibodies. Uh, and subsequently, even though uh, it was only about five months after its clinical approval, the FDA revoked the authorization of Eli Lilly's antibody therapy because. Uh, it was susceptible to E484K and K417, which as all of you know was uh, present in the gamma variant, but also in the beta variant. Um, now, after obviously those variants, Omicron came through at the end of 2021, and it drove escape to almost all neutralizing antibodies at that point. Um, you can see that essentially Omicron, these are neutralization curves, and you can see that the the basically this uh, bluish turquoise line at the bottom here is essentially drugs that have a s have lost uh, almost all uh, neutralization against Omicron. These are Regeneron drugs, and these are the Eli Lilly drugs. However, there's one drug uh, called Vir 7831, I think. I don't know. It, it goes by several different names. It actually maintained binding, pretty strong binding uh, in neutralization to Omicron. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. So as um, basically there was a big uh, public health problem at the end of 2021, at least in the United States. Um, but there was also some biotech issues. A company called Adagio was working on an engineered version of an antibody that didn't bind to Omicron and had to be pulled from uh, testing. And obviously that was a massive uh, problem for their investors. Uh, this is not the end of the story of Adagio. I'll talk about them in a minute or at the very end of the talk. Uh, and Regeneron also ended its clinical trials as well. So there, that one antibody that still had some neutralization maintained its clinical approval. And it was discovered in Bellinzona, Switzerland, uh, from um, basically this publication here. And it had a really interesting story. They discovered this antibody ta by taking the blood of a patient who was infected with SARS-CoV-1. You know, basically the SARS coronavirus that emerged in the early 2000s. And from that, they mined the B cells and found an antibody that bound both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And SARS-CoV-1 and 2 are pretty antigenically distant in terms of their RBDs. So what their hypothesis was, which is, um, you know, so Veer is the company that developed it in collaboration with GSK. And the CEO made a very triumphant statement right after Omicron emerged saying that it's the first antibody that was basically developed with a mutating virus in mind, right? Because the hypothesis is if you target something that can, if something can neutralize SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, it's probably targeting such a conserved site that it's gonna be essential and the virus will probably not mutate that site. And you know, for a while they were definitely correct because it was the only drug on the market uh, in the beginning of 2021. Well, obviously Omicron, or now we call it BA1, was not the end of the story. There were many other sub-lineage variants that emerged quite quickly. Uh, 
you can see here, here's BA2 uh, that rapidly spread across the globe, including in the US, South Africa, and the UK, but also BA4 and 5 emerged shortly thereafter. Well, uh, that drug from Veer uh, is also known as S309, and here it is in green. And what you see here is by the it, it worked, it only lost a little bit of potency to BA1, but by the time BA2 and BA4 and 5 came, it lost a, a lot of its neutralization potency. And therefore, it was by eight by March of 2022, so just like three months after that CEO's triumphant statement, he had to basically eat his words because uh, Omicron BA1, BA2 had emerged. Okay, so one of the problems then is how can you address this problem of a mutating virus? Well, there is a protein engineering technique, again, using yeast display and putting Mutation, mutated versions of the RBD on yeast display and screening it for binding to antibodies. And so basically you can do this experimental assay and then you sort the cells that lose binding, the RBD variants that lose binding to this antibody, perform deep sequencing and I identify mutations. So a researcher in the US named Jesse Bloom really pi uh, you know, drove forward this uh, approach, had a prolific publication record during the pandemic, and what they did is they made single point mutations across the RBD. And it was really powerful because you can see here that you know, E484K emerges as a major escape mutation to these Eli Lilly antibodies. And obviously that is a uh, mutation that occurred um, in variants. Now, the issue with this approach is that it was only set up to do single point mutations. Um, so Omicron, though, uh, is obviously not a single, <laughs> a small mutated variant. It has massive number of mutations, and I don't need to go through that because you're, uh, most of you are experts on this. So really it becomes how can you assess the impact of all of these combinatorial mutations on ACE2 binding and antibody escape? And remember, because protein sequence space is so large, there's no way on a 201 amino acid RBD read can you ever screen that experimentally. So again, what we decided to do, uh, so I'm going to show you very quickly uh, this study here. And then if I have time, I'll show you just two follow-ups that are now basically undergoing peer review, but they're online, so you can actually find them on BioArchive. And this study even posted on BioArchive yesterday. Okay. So what we call, a meth we call this method deep mutational learning. And what we did is we went and we made combinatorial libraries of mutations in the RBM. So remember the RBD, there's sometimes people refer to the, inter the motifs that interact with uh, neutralizing antibodies based on their class called RBM 1, 2, and 3. There's different designations for this. but So we made combinatorial libraries. And this variation here is based on the GSED database. So that's how we design the libraries. Um, and then so we make these combinatorial libraries. We screen them by yeast to say for binding and escape. And then we sort the binders and all of the ones that bind to ACE2. And we take the ACE2 binding variants and we screen them for binding or escape to these neutralizing antibodies. And what we're trying to understand is combinatorial mutations that would drive escape to these antibodies. And obviously we can't experimentally screen all of the mutations, so we do deep sequencing on all of these selections and train machine learning models that predict based on the sequence whether it's a binder or a, or escape variant. And this is kind of very similar to what we did for, for uh, trastuzumab, but we just reversed it now and we're doing it on the antigen rather than the antibody. Uh, this basically just shows that we you know, did the whole workflow and we ended up uh, having these are just performance metrics. We trained machine learning models for each one of these uh, antibodies, and most of them performed very well. A few of them didn't, mostly because the uh, antibodies were almost all escape variants, uh, so then you can't really train a model if everything escapes it. Um, and then this shows you that we did in silico evolution, meaning we took sequences starting from Wuhan and we created mutations on the computer, and we asked our machine learning model, does it bind or escape? Okay? There are 46 different variants, and once we then experimentally tested them, for ACE2 binding, we were correct about 93% of the time, and then when we did for the four antibodies, we did the two Regeneron antibodies and the two Eli Lilly antibodies, we were also correct based on the model predictions about 90% of the time. So it looks like the model is very accurate. And then what was really exciting is this is now kind of like, a, again, an in silico evolution. So these are heat maps that show binding or escape predictions using our machine learning. 
models. And we have the two Regeneron antibodies on top and the two Eli Lilly antibodies on the bottom. And what you see here is when you start with the beta variant and you just make one mutation from beta, you see most of, the Regeneron, most of those variants Regeneron still binds to. But the Eli Lilly antibodies have dropped out. When you make two mutations, at least this top Regeneron antibody is very robust to it, except there's a few here that have blue for all four antibodies, okay? And this is kind of a complex, uh, you know, uh, visualization, but basically there are 12 synthetic variants that escape from all of these antibodies. And we did all of this analysis in August of 2021, and we identified these positions as mutated, as being present in these uh, synthetic variants that escape all these antibodies. Well, 417, okay, everybody already knows that. 484, everyone knows that. Uh, 501, everyone knows that. However, 493, 498, and 505 had never been observed in the GSED database. So there was no uh, expectation that these would be muta mutations that can occur in SARS-CoV-2. Until three months later that Omicron popped up and all of these positions are mutated. Now, of course, more, more than those were mutated in Omicron, but it just shows you that this approach allows us to identify some really important positions that could be driving antibody recognition, antibody escape, and probably also viral, emer viral variant uh, emergence. Okay, so very briefly, I'm just gonna quickly go through these two in probably just three minutes. Um, but one thing I wanted to note is we all know that Omicron continued to uh, develop and most of the antibodies that were clinically approved eventually dropped out against the various versions of Omicron as they emerged. So now that gives you the problem is I showed you that in that first study, we picked those small regions of the RBM to make mutations. But Omicron taught us that you can have mutations across the entire RBD. So we had to go backwards and essentially create a library that would make mutations across the entire 201 amino acid RBD and perform a similar workflow uh, here, and I'll just walk through the highlight of this. So this is probably the most, uh, at least experimentally intensive part of the study, is we had to take the entire 201 amino acid RBD region and order all of these oligonucleotides and assemble them into this combinatorial library across this region. It was actually uh, pretty expensive in terms of the m number of oligonucleotides we had to order. But anyways, uh, but here is the 201 positions of the, of the RBD, and you see there's mutations across all of them. So our library covers the entire region. Um, we can then do that kind of uh, yeast display screening with uh, antibodies, and this is uh, information that shows you the mutations across this whole region. And now all that information can again be used to train machine learning models um, that, uh, that actually identify um, correctly for many of these variants, we took natural variants and we could find that they were pretty much correlated with experimental data. So we, again, created pretty accurate models, but now we're across the entire um, RBD region. Uh, and I will just say, for the punchline here, so what we did is we then made synthetic lineages. We took BA1 and we made a bunch of in silico evolution using the GSED mutations. And what we found is there are combinations of antibodies. These are now second generation antibodies with some binding to Omicron BA1. And when you now predict it against all of these now synthetic variants, some antibodies in combination cover more variants than others. So what this should hopefully show you is that you can, if you're really rational about selecting the right combinations, you might be able to have an antibody therapy that lasts the next round of viral evolution um, meaning that even if one of the antibodies in your cocktail no longer binds, if the other one does, it could still stay clinically approved. That actually happened with one of the Eli Lilly drugs, so there's precedent for that. Uh, and this is just shows you the sequence space. So our best antibody was ZCB11, but all, all the escape mutations are recaptured by these, some of, some of them are recaptured by these antibodies. So it helps you guide the selection. Random, rather than just randomly selecting two antibodies that target two different epitopes, you actually select it based on their potential escape variant space. Uh, and then this last study, uh, which we call synthetic coevolution, what we did is we actually make mutations to antibodies that have lost binding to RBD. We call this synthetic somatic hypermutation. We screen them with our mammalian display system and we recover antibodies that bind. And then we find what those new antibodies ha that bind and how they, uh, what escapes them. And what that is trying to mimic is the idea that when you get 
when you have a memory vSAL response, and then you get, let's say you had you know, the Wuhan virus, and then you now get exposed to a new variant, you will basically make, hopefully, memory B cells that somatically mutate and bind to the new variant. Now, what do those new antibodies escape from? I'm trying to understand that kind of in a synthetic system. Um, okay, so what's really exciting about this study is we just made a few mutations to the CDRH2 or CDRH3 of these eight different antibodies, and I'm gonna focus in basically on Regeneron 10933 because there's some pretty exciting results. Um, so we screen those, and then again, we, we use our mammalian display techniques, and we find the antibodies that bind to it. Now, this is Regeneron 10933, that we have now selected those small mutations to the antibody for new antibodies that might bind to Omicron BA1. And there's a variant here. Um, let's see if I can highlight it correctly. It's this one here, the fourth one with this blue triangle. It has one amino acid mutation and it's CDRH3. So that is called Regeneron 33, uh, I think it's two, okay? Well, it actually recovers with that single amino acid mutation, pretty strong neutralization to Omicron BA1. So by making one mutation, you can actually re-engineer it to bind to Omicron. And this is basically you know, the structural uh, prediction of that. And you might say, well, that seems pretty remarkable, but that might be underlying uh, you know, what might happen in somatic hypermutation. You don't have to make a huge, potentially a huge jump to do that. And we also found this other antibody, MAB82, also recovered some new binders to Omicron BA1 with just a couple of mutations. Uh, and then interestingly, once you make these re-engineered antibodies, they have different escape profiles. And then what's exciting is just last week, or I guess it was uh, two weeks ago, the FDA approved a COVID-19 antibody from Invivid. Invivid is the rebranded version of Adagio, um, and it's called Pemgarda. Now it is has a pretty. It was an immunobridging trial, and it had some interesting. And it has an interesting, um, you know, uh, target um, population and everything immunocompromised. But I actually had to do some digging because Invivid doesn't publish, didn't publish their work. But I could pull out this poster. And basically, they did exactly what we did. They made mutations to the CDRH3 and rescreened this, that, you know that antibody that they invested $750 million and failed? They took that antibody and re-engineered it with a, I, I, we actually did some uh, sleuthing and found, <laughs> found the sequence of the drug that, of Pemgarda, and it has eight mutations. So the, it only made, they only made eight mutations from the original uh, antibody that failed the clinical trial. And that process is, you know, shows you that it might be possible. And I just say this is kind of akin to updating seasonal vaccines. Maybe you can make small mutations, recover it, because the point here is this was done rather quickly. I mean, we did it uh, with just, you know, a grad student. So, I mean, if it's, uh, obviously, it's really possible to do this approach. Uh, okay, so this is the summary. Um, and just uh, very briefly, I do care a lot about T cells. We did a lot of work on engineering a T cell receptor engineering platform to try to tune affinities uh, and specificity of T cell receptors. Uh, and uh, we've started a company that was mentioned uh, with a really talented former postdoc in my lab, Rodrigo uh, Vasquez Lombardi, and it's called Engimmune. And then we have one more study, one more other technology. There's a technique called T cell engagers, which are basically bispecific antibodies that often target like a tumor associated antigen like CD19 on you know um, hematol like B cell cancers, and then it has a CD3 targeting arm. Well, these drugs are seven of these drugs that have been approved in the last uh, two or three years, but there's still a lot of patients that actually don't respond. And part of that is because many of those patients have either, these are hematological malignancies, so they have dysfunctional T cells or even a re highly reduced number of T cells. So one of the cr ideas that we had is could you just supply healthy donor T cells to these patients? Well, if you could, which are, of course, uh, could then augment and enhance the response because eventually it's not the antibody, it's the T cell that has to do the work. The problem with that is graft-first host disease. T cells from another patient, from an from a unrelated donor, would have you know, HLA mismatch and the donor T cells would attack the host MHC. So you definitely can't do that. So what we developed was a technology to decouple the TCR-CD3 signaling complex, essentially by making mutations to a highly conserved motif motif that's present on the TCR alpha J region, which is not only conserved across all human J regions, it's a conserved across species, this motif, 
Making two mutations to this motif means that TCR expresses on the surface, but it no longer signals through peptide MHC interactions, but the CD3 maintains its expression and the CD3 is active to be, uh, to be activated by a T cell engager. Uh, and we've also started a company, we're working on trying to get it financed. It's a weird concept, so it's not that easy to convince people, but uh, we, we, we hope that this is kind of an approach to making more powerful immunotherapies by just providing people with healthy T cells um, as the kind of mo uh, slogan for the company. Good, so I uh, just thank all the people in my lab and the funding sources and you for your patience for this very long presentation. Thank you, Sai. We are very advanced in the hour, so I think we have time for a few questions, like one or two questions. Well, I would like to know if you think that it's it will be able to like develop uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies using this approach. Yeah, so I think that the problem, it's possible, but one of the issues is that my view of broadly neutralizing is not trying to target a conserved region, because if you target a conserved region, it's probably not that, um, for SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't appear to be very effective. The class four antibodies, uh, are very conserved, it's a very conserved region, but it's not very potent. So the best potency for an antibody is targeting those RBMs, the ACE2 binding interface. But those are under massive s evolutionary pressure from the human population to mutate. So it, it would be very hard, but I think it <coughs> could be possible with a cocktail. I don't think you could make a single broadly neutralizing antibody. I think that you would, you would always run into the problem that your drug is facing uh, selection pressure from the population, <laughs> not mm -hmm. the drug. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't think a single one, but I think you can make a cocktail that is robust for a few years, um, which is better than what we currently have. Okay, yeah. So not only for COVID, this is important, but dengue, HIV, I mean, it's yeah. everybody's running after that. <coughs> um, any other questions? So thank you so much, Sai. Thank you so much, George.